since electricity was first produced in America, hydropower has really been America's original renewable. Um, and it remains a backbone of our energy infrastructure today, whereas uh, marine and hydrokinetics, MHK, uh, basically wave and current energy technologies, those are, those are the new kids on the block. Um, but uh, really, there are a lot, there's a lot more diversity to these two technologies than this slide lets on. Um, this is really the range of opportunities that water presents for both hydropower on the top and, and marine energy on the bottom. Um, and if I can just highlight a few of them, uh, starting with non-power dams, this is something that most folks might not know a lot about. So for reference, there's about 2,000 hydropower plants in the country. There are 80,000 dams that don't produce any energy. Uh, these were built for irrigation, uh, flood control, navigation, like uh, this dam here. Um, and a study that we released back in 2012 um, showed that just powering the top 100 of these could add another 6 gigawatts of generating capacity to the country. So that's more than enough for 1.5 million homes. And since then, we've instituted a number of different research projects to help develop technologies that can specifically take advantage of these resources. Um, wave energy is the most predominant marine energy source that the U.S. has, at least. Um, and for context, uh, just, just um, capturing about 5% of the technically available resource would power about a third of the West Coast. Um, and we've started a number of different programs to help develop these technologies, one that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, uh, the Wave Energy Prize, um, which was aimed at uh, doubling the state of the art of energy capture for these types of devices. Um, and last, but certainly not least, uh, pump storage. Um, most people probably don't realize that the U.S. has actually developed and been operating large commercial energy storage projects for decades. Um, pump storage, uh, where you pump water with excess electricity up to an upper reservoir and then run it back downhill through conventional turbines when you need the electricity, um, this represents more than 97% of our commercially available energy storage in the U.S. right now. Um, and we're working on a bunch of different research projects to help reduce the cost of new advanced pump storage technologies and make them more flexible as well. Um, one uh, project from a funding opportunity we recently announced was actually award to Shell, an award to Shell North, North America um, for them to investigate the development of new small lower cost closed loop pump storage systems that use um, innovative structures for reservoirs like abandoned quarries or mines. Um, uh, and aren't connected to a river system like this plant down in, uh, in Georgia is. Um, and so that allows them to be deployed much more widely all across the country, um, but also helps reduce any potential environmental impacts because you're not tied into a river system like this. Um, so to try and sum all of this up simply, um, this graph combines all of those different resource opportunities um, uh, into one visual. Um, and what you find is that there are really opportunities almost everywhere across the country. Um, there's significant wave energy resources all across the West Coast in Hawaii and Alaska, uh, more geographically isolated tidal energy resources in the Northwest and Alaska and the Northeast, um, and ocean current energy in the Southeastern U.S. Uh, because of the presence of the Gulf Stream. So, and hydropower um, uh, really um, is spread pretty well across the interior of the country. There are huge opportunities for developing those non-power dams I talked about in the Midwest. Um, for upgrading existing hydropower facilities in the southeast and in the northwest, and lots of opportunities for developing pump storage and new small low-impact hydropower projects. So all told, um, this equates to more than 100 gigawatts of potential, or roughly doubling the amount of hydropower, um, or water power, I should say, that we have in the U.S. right now. Um, so to, to downshift and, and talk just a little bit about hydropower for a couple of minutes, um, the, the one thing that I really want to re-emphasize is just how important the existing hydro fleet in the U.S. is um, to U.S. energy infrastructure. Um, it represents about uh, 6 to 7 percent of our, uh, of our uh, generation uh, every year. Um, is still the largest renewable energy re resource we have by generation, although asterisk there, I think wind power has just overtaken us in terms of capacity, so it's a good on them. Um, but uh, even more importantly than that, uh, it is probably one of the most flexible resources that we have available to us. Um, hydro and pump storage are often compared to natural gas in terms of the amount of services that they provide to the grid and the, the help that they provide in terms of integrating other variable renewables like wind and solar or making baseload generation like coal and, and nuclear more efficient themselves. Um, 
And to highlight that point, um, who here remembers the big blackout in the Northeast in 2003? Who, who survived it? Who lived through it? <laughs> who still has the t-shirt? <laughs> yeah, those are collector's editions. Um, uh, my point here is actually that um, in this huge event in the US, it was hydropower and pump storage plants in western New York um, that helped to stabilize the grid and keep the blackout from spreading, but also that started the, the first units available to help restart the grid um, when they were needed. Um, so to highlight just a few of the types of projects that we've supported over the years, this is a small hydropower plant in Kentucky. It's been grinding grain uh, since the Civil War. Um, still produces flour today. Uh, their muffin mix is fantastic. I know, product, product placement. Um, but uh, they also produce about twice as much energy as they did just 10 years ago because of a DOE research grant to deploy and demonstrate a new innovative generator technology. Um, and hydropower plants, they come in all shapes and sizes across the U.S. Um, from hundreds of small distributed plants like this to a fair number of big facilities like this. This is Grand Coulee. This is the largest hydropower plant in the U.S. Um, for context, it produces about the same amount of power as six, six to eight traditional nuclear coal plants. So almost seven gigawatts, more than enough for a million and a half homes. Um, and it's also owned and operated by the federal government, interestingly, as is about half the hydropower in the U.S. Um, and for that reason, our office has developed very close working relationships and partnerships with other federal agencies like the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation. We actually all just re-signed a big five-year agreement to continue to collaborate on research around hydropower. Um, and one of our projects uh, that just wrapped up last year um, that included DOE National Laboratories um, was an effort to improve the underlying physics of operational water quality models used at facilities like this to help improve their efficiency and reduce their environmental impacts. Um, this is another project developed by a relatively new company, um, Natel Energy. Um, and uh, at, an, at an existing irrigation canal, you can see this canal before the project was built. Um, and Natel got a, a research grant from DOE to uh, develop, test, and, and demonstrate uh, their new small hydropower technology. Um, and the project today is commercially operational, generating power under the grid, and all the power is actually being sold to Apple. Go figure. Um, and this company is really amazing, too. I mean, they've grown from just a couple of individuals a few years ago to several dozen today, and they just opened their first major manufacturing plant out in California last year. Um, so the last thing I'll say on hydropower, if you want to know more, uh, we just released uh, a major study several years in the making, the Hydropower Vision, uh, last year, which looks at a whole range of future scenarios in terms of development possibilities for hydro in the U.S. And it wasn't just DOE that did it. Um, more than 300 individuals from 100 different organizations, including other federal government agencies, hydropower owners and operators, environmental NGOs, universities, national lab staff, were all, were all involved. Um, so there, there was a huge amount of, of work and time and effort that went into that. Um, so to pivot to marine energy very quickly, um, I like to start with this quote because I think it illustrates both the difficulty but the allure of developing marine energy. I mean, it's just really hard to deploy anything in these high energy environments. I mean, an oceanographer that I was talking to once was like, why would you ever bother going there? That's where I lose all of my equipment. <laughs> um, but the prize is huge, too. I mean, because water is about 800 times as dense as air, um, uh, a small, fast-moving current or a medium-sized wave actually packs a lot of energy. I mean, that's one of the reasons why wind turbines are so comparably big and tidal turbines are so comparably small, it's energy density. Um, but there are a lot of uh, other potential benefits of marine energy, too. It's highly predictable and forecastable. So um, that's one of the reasons why surfers know what the waves are going to be like a few days in advance. Uh, and tidal currents can be predicted basically down to the minute. And that's highly valuable for grid operators and planners. So um, this was the state of the marine energy industry 10 to 15 years ago. It's probably what most people assume the state of the industry is today. A lot of um, you know, wild ideas drawn on the back of napkins, developed in garages, you know, crazy ideas all over the map. Um, this is actually the state of the industry today. Maybe still a few crazy ideas floating around there. Um, but uh, there, are, there are dozens of companies that have been started that are testing and demonstrating and deploying technologies all around the world, including the US. And, and this is just a sampling of technologies that are under development and that have been tested currently in the US. 
Um, almost all of these have received some kind of research support from Department of Energy as well. Um, and there's, there's no, there's no um, lying. It's, it's a difficult journey. Um, it's going to be a while before these technologies are um, cost competitive with commercial energy technologies today. Um, but um, there's, you know, there hasn't really been yet all of the technology convergence that we eventually saw in the wind energy industry. Um, and doing that um, and pushing that forward is going to take a lot of work, a lot of uh, testing and demonstration, a few successes, probably a few failures. Um, but that's not to say that the industry hasn't moved forward in leaps and bounds in recent years. Um, these are three examples of commercial tidal energy projects that have been deployed in three different countries in Europe. Um, each of these turbines produces um, about one to two megawatts, enough for a couple thousand homes. And you'll notice they all look very different, too. So there still hasn't been a lot of convergence in that sector as well. Um, but the other point I want to make here is that this is a globally developing market. And it's developing quickly. Um, and that presents an opportunity for US technologies and developers as well in terms of export and manufacture. Um, but we have to stay ahead of the curve. Other people are working on this uh, you know, very quickly as well. And there's also the potential for the US to get left behind if, if we don't um, push forward on our own. Um, and so to do that, so to stay on the cutting edge, at least in this case for wave energy technology, um, uh, our office supported this project, the Wave Energy Prize, for uh, the last couple of years. And as I mentioned before, the goal was to double the state of the art of uh, energy capture for wave energy devices. And when we first uh, announced this competition, more than 90 teams applied initially. And eventually, through several rounds, uh, nine of them moved forward to um, the Navy's gigantic wave basin just up the road in Maryland, uh, the Carter Rock facility, um, where each of them spent a week testing their devices in this, in this wave tank. And I have to say the results were actually stunning. Um, this was a challenge that we didn't think or we weren't sure that anyone would actually have been able to meet. You know, we were trying to set a pretty high bar here. And in the end, four of the nine teams were able to successfully at least double energy capture. Uh, and the winning team here, pictured from Oregon, uh, was able to increase energy capture by five times, um, and, uh, which is impressive. Probably even more impressive, though, um, they basically developed their device or their solution to this problem you know, out of a garage. Um, so that's American ingenuity at its best. Um, this is them with their $1.5 million grand prize winner's check. Um, the last thing that I will uh, say is uh, stress is about the need for testing facilities. Um, as I mentioned before, it's extremely hard to put anything in the marine environment. Um, and having pre-permitted sites, some infrastructure available like power cables and anchors, that just helps increase the pace of the design cycle. Um, and so uh, that's one reason why we've partnered closely with the US Navy um, to uh, develop and deploy uh, wave energy devices at a facility that they've built out off of a Marine Corps base that they have uh, out on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. Um, this is a device that's testing out there right now as we speak. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, but uh, um, their, their site here has the, uh, the capability of testing uh, three different uh, individual single devices. Um, and the Navy is interested in MHK for a couple of different reasons. One, to help power its, its bases, um, which are distributed you know, all over the world. Um, but also uh, because of the potential for providing um, remote or distributed power for sensors or instrumentation. Um, you know, national security infrastructure that, that none of us have the secure, security clearance to talk about. Um, and in, in complement to this facility, DOE is also supporting the development of a much larger wave energy test facility off of the coast of Oregon um, that is capable of testing arrays of different, multiple arrays of different devices in higher energy environments. So after a competitive process last year, we just announced recently that a consortium led by the University of, um, or by Oregon State University, um, uh, was going to be receiving about $40 million of federal funding, supported by more than $20 million of, of non federal um, money, uh, to build out this project. And when it's finished in about three or four years, it's going to position the US to be one of the world leaders in terms of wave energy development and testing. So, uh, with that, um, I want to just say in conclusion, if I leave you with, with one idea today, 
it's that there are really a, a wide array, a diverse set of opportunities for developing water power uh, technologies in the US. Um, hydropower remains uh, one of uh, the most critical components in our, in our energy infrastructure. Um, there are opportunities for it to grow. It is still growing, actually, today, um, contrary to maybe some popular opinion. And pump storage uh, represents one of the best near-term uh, opportunities we have to develop more energy storage and flexibility and security for the grid. Um, and while um, you may not be seeing uh, any MHK projects developed off a of beach near you in the next couple of years, they probably are much further along than most people think or realize. Um, and I don't think that the opportunity and the potential in them can be ignored. Um, so with that, thank you very much. I hope this was interesting. And please, if you want to know more, go to our new, uh, our new website. Thanks. Thank you.